Thanks everybody for coming to this talk. And um, I know for some of you it might be a different type of issue that are at a veg fest. Uh, considering that I'll be talking about different ways that people can help change the world with their food choices, not just the ways that impact non-human animals. So I really want to thank Greg and everybody at SF Edge Fest for asking me to speak at this event and um, for giving these issues a forum because they are incredibly important to show how all of these issues are connected. I think you're all set. I'm all set. Thank mm -hmm. you, Greg. And that's Greg if everybody didn't know that already. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of my background because I think in some ways to understand Food Empowerment Project and how we work and why it is that we do what we do, you have to understand my brain. So be prepared. So, um, and you'll have to follow along because I'm going to have to talk kind of fast. But basically I got in, um, I guess I'll start with my familial history. I actually went vegetarian when I was about five years old when my mom told me what I was eating was a chicken. And I was horrified to think that I was supporting the, the death of this animal. So I wanted to stop eating them. People always ask me, where did this come from? And the only thing I can think of, because I can't exactly remember everything I was thinking when I was five years old, is that this, around the same time when I was four, my parents were getting a divorce. And I think that what was instilled in me was this idea that I didn't want to break families that I didn't want to be responsible for tearing families apart. I grew up in Texas. Thankfully, I live in California now. But I did grow up there. And, um, you know, there would be cows in the fields everywhere. And I just started to realize that, like, I don't want to be the one responsible if that cow doesn't come home one day. That I don't want that on me. I don't, I mean, that's a, that's a huge responsibility. But unfortunately, my family didn't have a lot of money. And so we had to eat what people gave us. Not that I have a lot of money now, but I'm actually able to make my own decisions. Um, so, but basically I had to eat what people gave us. And so I wasn't able to stick with being a vegetarian. By the time I was 16 years old, I decided, you know, I'm gonna eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day for the rest of my life, but I'm not gonna be responsible for taking the life of another being. And it wasn't until I was in high school um, that I actually learned about veganism. And that was back in the late 80s in Texas, so you can imagine how well known it was at that time. But I was also involved in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, maybe you're familiar with the name Nelson Mandela, I encourage you to learn more about what was happening in South Africa and to be informed about a man named Steve Biko and all that he stood for as well. My mom, I'm a Chicana. I'm a very proud Chicana, uh, meaning that I'm Mexican, but I'm born in the United States. My family on my mom's side has been in the United States for 11 generations, even before Texas was Texas. And on my dad's side, I'm first generation. My mom, in growing up, talked to us about the great boycott organized by the United Farm Workers. And at that point in time, the United Farm Workers were on their second round of boycotts. And this boycott was done to educate people and inform people about agricultural chemicals that were used and the impact that it had on the farm workers. So I had all of this rolling around in my head and I was already using my food choices as I like to use food, because I don't really like food for the most part, but I like food as a tool for social change. And I realized that all these different ways I could help create change and make sure that I wasn't supporting things that I didn't believe in. But I went down the path and I eventually put all my time and energy and my life and my passion into animal rights. Being a rebellious teenager and in Texas and talking about animal rights was very different. And I started the first animal rights group at a high school in Texas and I started an animal rights group at my university which then became um, the an animal rights group in Austin, Texas. And Syed, who's sitting right there, raise your hand, Syed, was a part of my animal rights group when I was in college. So that's how long we've known each other. <laughs> Not that he and I are old or anything like that, just saying. We've been doing this a long time. So, but in doing this work, you know, I eventually ran an organization called Viva USA where I did investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses and created corporate changes. I got Pier 1 Imports to stop using feathers in all their products. I got Trader Joe's to stop selling all duck meat. The campaign I ran against Whole Foods Market sparked the CEO of Whole Foods to go vegan. All of these things that I was doing, every single time I tried to nudge and talk about the treatment of farm workers, that I can't talk about people eating strawberries when 
There's a campaign right now encouraging people to boycott strawberries because of the farm workers and how they're treated. When people would say that their chocolate was cruelty free, but I knew it came from West Africa where slavery was taking place, I couldn't keep my mouth shut anymore. And what happened is, is that many people in the animal rights movement pushed back at me and told me, how could I waste the animal's time talking about human rights issues when I should be talking about only non-human animals? When I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela, and I basically was there to talk about farms and corporate agriculture and how they hurt the workers, the animals, and the environment, I realized that I could no longer just talk about non-human animals, that I had to do more, that all of these issues were connected. I'm using the clicker for the first time. Good, you can see it. So I realized that I had to help draw connections to these issues for human animals and for non-human animals. Because to me, all forms of oppression are connected. There's always the same root seeking to dominate and injure the most vulnerable in society. And that we have to work together to change all of this. So that's my brain. That's how the concept of Food Empowerment Project came about. And I'm going to quickly go through some of the main concepts of the food justice work that we do. I'm going to talk about animals raised and killed for food, farm workers, environmental racism, chocolate and the worst forms of child labor, corporate malfeasance, access to healthy foods, and what you can do, which I ultimately think is one of the most important things, is how we can create change. So, as I said, I've been vegan since 1988, and I've been doing animal rights since 87. Veganism is at the core of all of our work. And Quincy here, who lives at Woods, oh, you can't see his little eye, but y'all can see how cute he is, I hope. Um, Quincy lives at Woodstock Sanctuary in upstate New York. And to me, I show Quincy, this is a talk that I give to vegans and non-vegans. But Quincy is who I want to show people, because to me, Quincy epitomizes who it is and why it is that we encourage people to go vegan. Because Quincy deserves his own life. He deserves to feel the grass under his webbed feet. He deserves to swim. He deserves the ability to immerse his head. And he deserves to live without fear of human beings want to eat, wanting to eat him or take his feathers away from him. He is why we support veganism and why we encourage everybody who has access to healthy foods to go vegan. I'm going to assume that most people in this room are vegan or vegetarian or on the path. And so I'm not going to go through, typically I go through every single animal and talk about the investigations that I've done of factory farms and slaughterhouses. But I'm going to skip over some of them. And um, so this is actually a cow um, who lives at Vine Sanctuary in Vermont. And I show cows because when I talked about before about separating families, I think that cows are one of the best and yet worst examples of what it is that I'm talking about. The worst example because of the pain that they endure. But the best example because so many of us associate cows and their babies. People think of milk and as most of us in this room know that we are the only species that consumes the milk of another species into adulthood. But the most important thing for me because Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization for ethical reasons is the fact that this mother, this cow, has no right to her own body that somebody else is constantly making decisions for her and she doesn't even get to make decisions for herself. Not only is she constantly impregnated so that she can produce enough milk for people to consume, she also has her babies constantly taken away from her. And her babies are taken away from her sometimes um, tw within 24 hours after birth and sometimes immediately after birth. I don't think I can click on the sound, but you can go to other of my talks or I can even send it to you, but basically the, the sound of the mom and the babies bellowing back and forth to each other is something that I've documented. From farms as small as the ones in Georgia or large as California, the moms and the baby cows bellow back and forth to one another. And it's an incredibly excruciating sound. And it doesn't matter how large or how small these farms are, it's all the same. It doesn't matter if it's two cows that somebody has or 17,000 cows that somebody has. No matter what, the industry needs appreciable amounts of milk in order to 
sell the milk that they produce. And what they all have in common is that they take the babies away from their mothers. Oh, this isn't what I meant to show next. But these, are ca these pigs um, also live in um, Woodstock Farm Sanctuary in New York. And in doing my investigations of pig farms, and I investigated pig farms where the mother pigs were kept in farrowing crates and gestation crates where the crates are so small they can't turn around, as well as in the growing areas where the pigs are um, fattened up, basically. And again, these are babies. They're killed when they're six months old. And I actually videotaped a pig dying right in front of me who had an ulceration so large on his stomach that he eventually keeled over. And you can watch the video online because we use it in our outreach. But again, no matter how small or how big these farms are, and again, for anybody who's gotten to know a pig, you know they kind of run up to you with their floppy ears. Well, they kind of did that to me when I was videotaping them in the factory farm. I was pretty scared. <laughs> I was like, here, they have really big teeth and stuff, but it was heartbreaking. So the last animal I'm going to go through is fish, because a lot of people don't think of fish as sentient beings. They think of fish as somehow growing on trees, somehow they're vegetables, so you're a vegetarian, and you can eat fish, which is impossible. Um, and also the way that our country looks at fish. We don't even count fish as individuals. Fish are counted in tonnages. So how many fish are killed for food? Well, there isn't an exact number, but what they, we do know is they're counted as tons, not individuals. And I could go in and I can tell you how intelligent fish are. The fact that carp remember the pain of a hook up to a year after they've been hooked. Or a new, a new information that just came out this week about rabbit fish, who actually, when one of them is eating, they watch to make sure that no one else is going to attack that fish. And they have a reciprocal relationship, is actually what the scientists called it. But at the end of the day, for me, it doesn't matter how smart the animal is. The point is they can feel. And that should be enough for us to not cause harm to them. Intelligence doesn't matter in terms of our compassion as far as I'm concerned. So one of the other things, and I always think that the Bay Area is a great area to talk about this. How many people here are familiar with the term environmental racism? Cool. So for those of you who don't know, environmental racism means when a population, predominantly a community of color, people of color, live. Um, they're exposed to more negative pollutants. So in the Bay Area, you have Richmond as a prime example, where you have Chevron there, who's constantly contaminating the air supply there. We have the port in Oakland. So we have all of these toxic chemicals that are impacting the lives of the community. And it's no different from factory farms. So we, in North Carolina, where you have predominantly pig farms, you have majority of the people living there are black communities and indigenous community and some Latino communities in these areas where people can't even open their windows on hot summer days because of the flies, where people are suffering from nosebleeds and diarrhea from the stench. When I investigated the pig farms, it took me like six times to shower in order to get the smell of the pigs out of my hair. And my hair used to be a lot longer, so it took a really long time. And what's worse that a lot of people don't think about is the property values also go down. Because who's going to want to live in an area right next to a pig farm? Nobody. In California, we have a similar situation. That says Cal oh. So in California, we have a lot of dairies. In fact, we're the number one producing dairy state in the U.S. You have some dairy farms with 25,000 cows. You also have small farms. Regardless of the size of the farm, one dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure per day. When you add that up, it's a lot of excrement. And who's living in these communities are predominantly Latinos living in these communities. Where again, you have some of the highest rates of asthma because of the impact of the dairy industry and all the things that come along with it. Sorry. So, as I mentioned, Food Empowerment Project, we're a vegan organization. But as we promote veganism, we can't always talk to people about how their food is bad, how their food impacts the animals, it impacts the environment, it impacts workers, without taking some recognition of the impact that we're having as well. 
For me, it was kind of impossible to encourage people to go vegan and not talk about what's happening to the farm workers. You have over 3 million farm workers in the United States. Approximately 400,000 of these farm workers are children. Farm workers, life expectancy is about 49 years old. You have farm workers who live near creeks, near rivers, who don't have enough money to buy fruits and vegetables that they're picking. They live in cardboard boxes. They live in pickup trucks. And yet, they work 18, 8 to 14 hours a day in all extreme temperatures. These people are the working poor. You have groups like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers who are working to get one penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny more is all they're asking for. And Wendy's will not give this to them. Publix, which is a grocery store chain in the southeast, will not give it to them. That's all that they're asking for. So Food Empowerment Project, we work supporting corporate campaigns such as those um, by the Mockley workers, as well as the Sakuma workers who are encouraging a boycott of Driscoll's Berries. We've done protests in front of Costco's trying to get them to stop selling Driscoll's Berries. We encourage you to support that boycott and talk to any grocery store selling those berries, and I can give you more information if you'd like. We also work on regulatory changes, and we also do our best to do some on-hands work. So we actually co-sponsored an event, uh, a Farm Worker Appreciation Day, which took place in Salinas. And we did a food drive for the farm workers, all vegan foods donated to the farm workers. We donated a truck's worth of food. Because of our participation, because they wanted our involvement, we also made sure that all the food at the event was vegan. We also, I was able to go and speak at this event as well. It was all, the entire event was in Spanish, and every single time the event was described, it was described as zero waste and vegan. And I was able to go up and talk about what happens to animals in factory farms. When I talk about the regulatory work that we do, one of the issues um, which is really despicable that's taking place in California and only in California is that about, um, this is going to sound strange, but 1 to 12 percent of farm workers live in migratory labor camps in California. I say 1 to 12 percent because there's no real good number. Again, farm workers are migratory and a lot of, unfortunately, people see them as invisible and they, they don't matter and we want to change that. But about 1 to 12 percent of farm workers live in these migratory labor camps, and the state of California has a law on the books that states that farm workers, when they pick, and this is hard for me to explain, so hopefully I'll do it so you understand it. They close the labor camp when picking season is not going on, right? So you live in this labor camp, picking season is over, then they require you to move 50 miles away from that labor camp, which means if you have children in school, you have to pull those kids out of school. So it impacts the children's education. That's why the graduation rate of a lot of high school, of a lot of farm worker kids is so low. So we're working with the coalition to try and change this. And these are some statistics. Um, and basically what it's saying is that the question at the top says whether interviewees believe 50 mile rule affects their children's education. If you look at the total, 91.4% of the families believe this is impacting their child's education. The next slide at the top asks whether the interviewers believe that their child would benefit from being able to finish school where they're going. Now this isn't rocket science, right? There's a lot of information out there that talks about kids changing schools impacts their education. And this is actual interviews from the people living in these labor camps. And the state of California said, they wanted more information. This wasn't good enough data for them to change anything. So what I'm asking you to do is keep informed with us because we're going to make damn short. Can I say damn, Greg? Is that okay? Thanks. Okay. Got approval. Thank you. We're going to make damn sure that they do not ignore what's happening to farm workers and we let them know that we care about what's happening to farm workers and they can't do this to them, not while we're here. The other thing that Food Empowerment Project does is we do a school supply drive for the children of farm workers. And anybody in this room who participated that, I'm thanking you sincerely from the bottom of my heart. 
We collected almost 400 backpacks for the children of farm workers. We collected thousands of pens, pencils, notebook paper, crayons, scissors, everything for these children. This is the huge pickup truck that was absolutely massive that I was too scared to drive that we drove down to Watsonville to deliver the school supplies. These are some of the happy recipients. And then this is the other picture, because I can't ever, girls and boys, I need them both. So they were very, very happy to get the school supplies, if you can believe it. We did it in two areas in Watsonville, um, all undocumented community members. We ran out of school supplies. And there was nothing more heartbreaking than telling these kids that we didn't have any more. We promise them that we'll be back next year and we'll have more school supplies for them. We were also able to tell the children and the parents that we were doing this, one, because we wanted to thank their parents and we wanted to let them know that we cared and we wanted to give back a little for all that they do for us. They pick everything that we eat. Unless you grow your own food, your food is thanks to a farm worker. And we were able to tell the children how much we wanted them to succeed and how much we wanted them to get a good education. Another part of the work that we do is focusing on slavery that's currently taking place in Western Africa for chocolate. So 70% of the world's chocolate comes from Western Africa. And this is where some of the worst forms of child labor, including slavery, are taking place. Here you have children um, working, some as young as seven years old have been documented. How they get there is from a variety of reasons. One is sometimes they are sold into it by a family member. Um, nearby, so let's say some of the countries that grow cacao, Ghana and the Ivory Coast are near some of the poorest countries in the world, Bur Burkina Faso and Mali. And what happens is the family member, maybe an uncle or aunt, is watching over one of them and they sell the children into this for money. You also have children whose parents believe that they're actually going to go and work and they're going to make money and bring it back to the family and they never see their child again. Worse are the children who are actually stolen from marketplaces and trafficked hundreds of miles away from their family to work in the cacao fields. I hope you can see this. So hopefully everybody can read this. But this is what made me in 2000 when I learned about it. They asked a slave who had escaped, what would you say to Westerners who eat chocolate? And he said, tell them when they're eating chocolate, they're eating my flesh. And I thought this was the same thing as a non-human animal would say. How can I ever look at chocolate in the same way again? Right now, if you look up, there's a few lawsuits going on from slaves who have escaped and um, who are suing the companies, as well as um, some consumers in California who are suing Hershey's and Nestle's for selling chocolate at, by the hands of slaves. So again, children are forced to work in these fields carrying machetes, which is actually illegal by the UN standards. They're forced to carry heavy cacao bags. Oops, I'm showing a different slide. But this is actually from 2013. And what you can probably not see, but if you look really close, these young girls have scars on their arms and their legs. And these children are working in a certified farm. Um, so again, if you read the, these accounts online of these slaves, you can read things about how they were beaten severely, how some of them had their, their feet cut in order to prevent them from running away. These children are locked in at night. If they try to escape, they're beaten. 1.8 million children in the Ivory Coast and Ghana are victims of the worst forms of child labor. So what Food Empowerment Project decided to do was I would give this talk and people say, OK, what kind of chocolate can I buy? And I would say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so after a while, our volunteers, we started to collect companies that make vegan chocolate. So a lot of companies make dark chocolate and they make non-dark milk chocolate. So our list, for a company to make our list, they have to at least make one vegan chocolate to make our list, which has actually encouraged some companies to make vegan chocolates because they want to be on our list. So our list is, um, made, is determined by country of origin. So we don't really recommend chocolate from Western Africa. 
except for a company called Divine, and that's because it's a worker-owned cooperative, and the workers are making the decisions about where their profits come from. It's not a Western entity coming in and telling people what to do with their profits. They're making these determinations. So this is when we talk about the fact that just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's cruelty-free. If it's at the hands of slaves, it's not cruelty-free, regardless if there's cows in it or not. Okay, so I'm going to talk really fast now. Um, so outside, there's a company called Jacques that's right across from our table. They are good chocolate. There's another company called Cocomels. They are also on our good list. So I'm going to talk really fast, so I apologize. I was going on and on earlier. So we also have on our list companies we don't recommend and why we don't recommend them. They're sourcing from Western Africa or they won't disclose to us. And I encourage you to um, check out these companies, see if there's somebody you buy from that we don't recommend, and reach out to those companies. We've had companies switch because of that. And we have free apps that you can download. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can download the app for free. Andreas is showing it right there. And if you know how to work apps, please let me know because our app guy is in really busy right now and we need to fix it. It still works though, as Andreas can tell you. For any of you who support, oh, so that's for the Android. For those of you who supported our campaign against Cliff Bar, we campaigned against Cliff Bar for over three years to disclose country of origin, which they did not do until we were about to deliver 83,000 signatures to their headquarters in Emeryville on Human Rights Day. Then they disclosed country of origin. Collective voices make the difference. Always having to put pressure on corporations to make changes. We still don't recommend them because they source from Western Africa. Quickly, we also encourage people to boycott companies such as Coca-Cola. They're responsible for privatizing water in countries such as India and in Chiapas, Mexico. They have some of the worst records for uh, offending and discriminatory issues in the United States. They also, uh, let's see, how do I word this officially? Um, they, the union workers in Colombia who have organized against them have been murdered. Not saying there's a correlation, but perhaps. Um, one of the other areas we work on, which I really want to talk a little bit more about, can you, hopefully this is okay, because I want to leave time for Q&A. We work on lack of access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities. And these are areas um, where you have more liquor stores and fast food than you have healthy foods, where you don't have as many um, urban gardens or grocery stores or cooperatives selling the food. And I bring this up, one, because I, very, I care very passionately about this issue, because people of color are predominantly the ones that are impacted. But I also talk about it because I get concerned when vegans act as if anybody can go vegan, and it's not difficult to go vegan, because that's not true. And anybody who knows these issues and who lives in these communities knows better. And we need to be more aware of that, and we need to be more responsible when we talk about these things. So, quickly, this is an international problem. I've spoken in New Zealand about this issue, and the Māori are the most impacted. I've spoken about this in Canada, and it's the First Nations people who are impacted. In the United States, it's predominantly black, Latino, and, and the Native American populations that are impacted, and Filipino communities. So I'm going to race through this as much as I can to tell you all what we did. I moved to San Jose for a job, and when I moved there, I realized that I lived across the street and I worked across the street from two liquor stores in downtown San Jose. But I knew that this area called Silicon Valley was also an area of great wealth. And I didn't understand this you know, discrepancy. So we sent out a couple dozen volunteers to go and physically survey every single location in comparing high-income areas and low-income areas in Santa Clara County. And we came out with our report on, on, um, on the discrepancies between the high-income areas and low-income areas. And some of our findings include that organic was practically non-existent in the low-income communities. Higher-income communities had 14 times more access to, fresh, um, to frozen vegetables. There practically was no freezer sections in these other communities that didn't just have ice cream and pizza. And we also surveyed on meat and dairy alternatives. And the reason for this is, one, because most of us know, universally, it's understood, that a diet high in animal products and not high in fruits and vegetables is bad for your health. 
But we also did this for the ethical reasons. As an ethical organization, we believe that everybody has a right to eat their ethics. That people should have the right to eat what they believe in and shouldn't be forced to consume something. Because I'm telling you, non-dairy milk was almost non-existent in these communities. And what makes this worse, and which makes the word food apartheid make sense, is that it was not in these communities. Was when you consider that 60 to 80 percent of black communities, 50 to 60 percent of Latino communities, almost all indigenous communities, and 98 percent of Asian communities cannot digest lactose. We are hesitant on using the word lactose intolerant these days. Because the word lactose intolerant means there's something wrong with us people of color who can't digest the milk of another species into adulthood. There's nothing wrong with us. Colonialism is what brought this into our diets. Columbus brought cows into Latin America on his second voyage. They are not native to us. So that's why we can't digest this. We also found that there are some problems in how the government records this information. You can see here on the left-hand side is how anybody who's wanting to build a grocery store in one of these communities would say, oh, it's pretty much equal between low income and high income. Reality is the graph on the right. What happened is, is these little liquor stores masquerading as grocery stores get counted as grocery stores. So the little market next to, you know, as part of a liquor store is counted just like Safeway would be. So after we did this work, we went back into the communities and the most impacted communities, which were in San Jose, and we asked the community what they wanted. Because too many times, well-intentioned government officials or NGOs come in and tell the communities what they need instead of finding out what the communities want. The solutions are going to come from these communities, not somebody else coming in and telling them what they think they should have. And what typically happens is they come in and they think Walmart is the solution. Walmart is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Poverty follows Walmart. So you can find, this is, we put out a report, all the focus groups were conducted in Spanish. We have copies of the report on our table. We also have all of our reports online that people can download. I'm going to skip over our findings because I don't have a lot of time. But what I will say really quickly is in three of the focus groups we did in the most impacted communities, in two of them the parents had kids who were vegan. And we're also going to be doing some work on WIC because we found out WIC does not know how to encourage people to eat more vegetables. Um, our work also showed us that it's not only lack of access to healthy foods that's the problem. It's the fact that people aren't making living wages. The way that people are going to be able to afford we don't think the price of food should go down. That's already a problem. What needs to happen is that people need to support living wage efforts. Food Empowerment Project encourages as everybody who wants people to go vegan, Support every single living wage campaign that's out there, from the restaurant workers to the any type of worker, the home care workers, everybody deserves to make a living wage so that they can live, they can eat healthy, and their families can thrive. Thank you. Okay, eight minutes for questions and answers. Okay, so when I talk about vegans being careful about saying that anybody can go vegan, this is what I'm talking about. Now, I always have to explain that this is blurry, not because I really, I only have a Blackberry, but that's not the only reason. It's, oh, poor Blackberry, this is being recorded. I love you, Blackberry, don't go out of business. Okay, is because this is the reality of most liquor stores. This is where a majority of people get their food and a lot of, this is from Vallejo, which is where we're currently doing work. This is where people are getting their food from. You've got potatoes, onions, and a couple of bananas and some apples. And that is where they're getting their produce from. It's almost impossible for somebody to eat healthy and be healthy if this is the only access they're going to have to healthy foods. That's why we're trying to do the work that we're doing and working with communities to try and increase this. The work that we do... This focus group work and all this is to help those community groups get funding. Because they're the ones, they, I mean, we need funding too, hello. But they're the ones who are on the ground doing the work and we want them to get the funding that they need. Now this was a little oasis that we found also in Vallejo. This is a grocery store owned by a Latino family, a brother and his two sisters, which I was overjoyed to see. 
So we went out, we were asked by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party to take a look at Vallejo, which is where he lives. And we also work with the Vallejo People's Garden to do the assessment in Vallejo. And although we've been waiting a while because we're, our volunteers are doing it, we love our volunteers, but we're waiting a long time. These are some of our preliminary findings in Vallejo. One of the most striking is that 93% of all liquor stores in Vallejo are in low-income neighborhoods. This is additional information about what's happening in the high income areas. Overall, Vallejo has a problem with grocery stores in general, but it's far worse in the low income communities than in the higher income communities. So now I'm going to jump over to what you can do. If you have access to healthy food, we encourage people to go vegan. Lend your voice to the needs of the farm workers. Buy organic when you can. Organic doesn't mean that farm workers are treated any better. Just like we know that about any animal who's raised in organic ways, it doesn't mean they're treated any better. This just means that the agricultural workers are, doused, are not going to be doused with agricultural chemicals. So it's one less bad thing for them. Ethical chocolate, we encourage you to use our list. We update our list, well, again, practically every month. So if there's a company that you like that's not on our list, you email us the name of the company, we'll contact that company for you, and then we update our list. So the app is also updated at the same time. Boycott companies such as Coca-Cola. We actually have a whole section on our website of companies we want you to boycott, like Nestle and Monsanto as well. Speak out about the issues of food injustices. Sign up for our e-alerts. We have a table out there. We also, if you're not vegan and you're interested in going vegan, we have a monthly newsletter that we mail people who are brand new vegans, six months or less, or who want to go vegan. And you get one issue a month for a year. And we mail it to you because we know not everybody has the privilege of accessing the internet 24-7. So you get, we mail it to your home address. We give you a survey because we're actually collecting data on you, but we're also collecting data on the newsletter. So at the end of you getting the newsletter for 12 months, we give you another survey to determine how useful it was for you. Then we will be able to make changes to the newsletter. We don't want to keep on doing it if something's not successful in it. Oh, we also have monthly protests at Petaluma Poultry. Um, we just did all day, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. yesterday, but typically the protests are two hours in front of a chicken slaughterhouse. We also do bear witnessing where we are there for the chickens when they're actually trucked in at the, at the dead of night. Um, all of this information is in English and in Spanish on our website, fully referenced and a lot more. We also have information on coffee and the coffee companies that we feel comfortable recommending. We also have information on bananas, which is all about colonialism and sexism in bananas. And I'm sorry, we only recommended like maybe three or four bananas. And we also have veganmexicanfood.com, which are recipes. Again, the website is fully in English and in Spanish. And that is it. And I want to thank you all for coming again. And I did leave time for Q&A. And I want to ask you that I know some of this can be overwhelming. And what I ask for you to do is recognize and to think of all of this as opportunities to help create change. Don't be overwhelmed by it, but look at your food choices. We do eat three to four times a day. Ooh, I just added an extra meal. Um, <laughs> And we have to look at each one of those as a decision that we make to determine are we eating our ethics or not. We have the ability with food. I don't have that ability with my laptop as much or my phone as much, but I do with food to find out how it's being made, where it comes from. I also ask for you to look at these as your individual choices, but to not ever forget the collective voices that we have, that all of our voices together are what creates change. So thank you. Okay, so how much time on Q&A? 15, we have 15 minutes for Q&A. Paris is waving her hand. Go ahead, Paris. I'm just curious about Vallejo and the food desert thing. You said they don't have any other grocery or whatever, but what about farmer's markets? Do they have any other? There is a farmer's market there, um, and we don't use the term food deserts just so people know because we feel like it doesn't take into consideration 
what I was talking about in terms of cost. It's not just about access, it's about cost. But there is a farmer's market in Vallejo. One of the things we actually suggested to San Jose was one, to make sure that all the information about farmer's markets is bilingual. And in Vallejo, it should be trilingual for the Filipino community. And also to make sure if they're actually there to help communities of color and low-income communities gain access to that food, they may need to make sure when is the most appropriate days and times for them to go. So it's still seen as kind of expensive, unfortunately. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of people have to take buses to get to the food. And actually, we were working with a group in St. Louis, and not only did they close down a group. Okay, now, now, thank you, Paris. Now I can rant against another corporation. <laughs> not only did they close down a grocery store and move it to where people have to take two buses, the bus does not allow people to carry on more than two bags of groceries at a time. Okay, so let me backtrack to Vallejo. Now I'm gonna take the grand stage. So one of the things we found out in Vallejo was that, oh, I just messed up the videotaping, sorry. One of the things we found out in Vallejo was that Safeway closed down their grocery store in downtown Vallejo and reopened it in a suburban area. When they left that grocery store, they put a deed on the property preventing any other grocery store to move in for 14 years which has impacted the community, and we're gonna highlight this in our report. We found out they also did this in Washington, D.C. I have been in communications with Safeway. I'm trying to get them to change this policy on a corporate level and not do it anymore. If Safeway drags their heels, we're gonna want all of you to let Safeway know that this is unjust. It may be legal, but it's not ethical. So we're gonna want everybody to help us and tell Safeway this has to change. Yes. Lisa Allen, you were very good to her, and I will always appreciate that. Oh, thank you. I always have a soft spot for students. Actually, we always do our literature for free for anybody, really. But any student, I will email you. I will talk to you on the phone. I will do anything to help you because I'm so excited when students, they've got a lot going on, and they take the time to start a group. It means a lot. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, I do lots of talks. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you, you go by our table, I can give you my card. And yeah, I'm always happy to do talks. And yeah, I'll be speaking at Harvard. So Ivy League will be hearing all this. All the corporations will love me, I'm sure. All the future. Uh... <laughs> Anything else? Well, please stop by our table if you haven't already. We have literature and. Um, our sign-up sheet. And thank you all again for coming and for caring about these issues. Yeah. I have my glasses on to see. <laughs> oh, that was on the mic. <laughs>